1885. During the course of the work undertaken to irrigate the Gobi Desert, a strange fragment of rock was discovered. Several remarkable features of this rock attracted the attention of the scientists engaged on the project. Research revealed that it contained a spool. Further analysis showed the material to be extraterrestrial in origin and not of human manufacture. Where did it come from? Then somebody remembered that in June 1908 in Siberia, an explosion had occurred equivalent in force to a hydrogen bomb, an explosion visible within a radius of 350 miles. At the time, it was thought to have been caused by a giant meteor. 77 years later, an international expedition tried to determine the trajectory and the point of impact and to find some debris of what was called the Tonggu meteor. Shortly afterwards, under the auspices of the World Federation for Space Research, scientists meet to celebrate the anniversary of the establishment of the first space station on the moon. Professor Herringway from the United States makes a public statement about the famous meteor. Our calculations indicate, confirmed also by the results recently transmitted to us by our colleagues on Luna 3, that the mysterious Tunga meteor was really a spaceship from another planet which exploded in the air before landing. This hypothesis stimulated scientific thought throughout the world. Reporters of every nation are waiting to hear what the nuclear physicist Professor Orloff has to say. <laughs> the hoax of the flying saucer variety. And what about this spool that was found in the desert some 350 miles from the crater of the explosion? How do you explain that, Professor Orloff? Well, I believe there was a grave emergency. When the rockets normally used for deceleration refused to function, the captain of the spaceship decided to save what he considered was most valuable. I'm referring naturally to this spool, which may contain a document of prime importance in an unknown language, recorded apparently by magnetic process. An international committee of expert linguists was offered access to the world's largest computer to try to decipher this strange language. This is Dr. Chen Yu. Not only is he one of the world's leading authorities on languages, but also his biological work is of immense importance. Humanity is in debt to him for the technique of transforming inorganic substances into foodstuffs. He directs the committee with world-famous mathematician Professor Sikarna, whose work rivals even that of Einstein. In the astrophysical domain, we've made rapid progress. And although we haven't deciphered the mysterious message, we have determined the ship's launching base. At the moment, there can be no doubt, this spaceship was launched within our solar system. I can even say that it was definitely launched from within the path of our planet. Now, since there can be no life on Mercury, there is only one other planet that it could have come from. I am referring to the Earth's sister planet, Venus, the morning star. on Earth. That's right. It certainly is a chemico-physical analysis of the atmosphere well, and crust of the Earth. Earth. we have just heard are the first words of the inhabitants of another planet, a cosmic document. Yes. Yes, but it's unfortunate that the magnetic spool was damaged through the effect of the high temperature. 
which prevailed aboard the cosmic vessel at the time of the crash. And that's the reason we've only heard a part of the text. We must try to find a method to renovate the rest. First, we'll immerse the spool in a chemical catalytical medium, and after that, subject it to radiation. Chen Yu? Yes, that's a very good idea. All that we have learned indicates that on Venus there is a highly developed life form. Yet I'm wondering why Venus stays silent. It's very surprising. Now we know a little of this language. We must, at every cost, communicate with her. I agree with you. It's high time I'm we made this. Right. Well, 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 well then, then I'd like to propose a course of action. I think the most logical thing to do would be to request that our governments consent to train all the radio and radar stations of the world and Venus. Polar Station calling Moon Space Station. Attention, please. Luna 3. Attention, please. Luna 3. Thank you. This is Station Luna 3. I'll keep it in mind. Station Luna 3 calling Earth. No replies yet from Venus. Our signals are reaching the planet, but so far there's no reply. We'll keep you informed. <laughs> Good morning, my friends. May I please have an interview with you? This afternoon, I have news of the utmost importance to announce. As you probably know already, our most modern spaceship, the Cosmostrator, is now completed and ready to set forth on our exploration of space. The World Federation for Space Research has decided to change the destination of the Cosmostrator. Instead of sending her to Mars, she will be directed toward the planet Venus. Oh, that's great news, isn't it? Have you any ideas to the date of the takeoff? One more question, if you don't mind, Professor. Do you think there's anybody living on Venus? Did you manage to make contact with Venus? No, my friends, Venus is silent, but we'll soon discover why. And who's going with you? Well, let me present some of the other scientists who'll take part in this expedition. They are all first-class specialists, chosen from among the most qualified in their particular fields. They, with others who are coming, will form the crew of Cosmostrator 1. The units of propulsion are in perfect working order. That's fine. The crew can now attend to their personal affairs. We'll start late tomorrow night and fly following the hyperbolic trajectory. Good. I'll make a last check. See you later, Doral. Taloa, will you please make a thorough recheck of the radar? Right away, Professor. This is Vision calling the world. We have just showed you the preliminary tests of the Cosmostrator's rockets. Arriving now is Brinkman. The first American spaceman to land on the moon. Ladies and gentlemen, I have an important announcement to make. Intervision is going to present you minute by minute the historic launching of the Cosmostrator. We know very well how much you'd like to be here with us. Unfortunately, that's impossible. The only ones admitted are those directly concerned with the countdown and final blast off of the rocket. So I will try to describe in detail everything that's taking place. Intervision will bring to you the wonderful story of this great event. Ah, but here come the first members of the crew. Among them is Professor Durand, the chief engineer. He's a French scientist well known for his work on robots. Thank you, thank you. We'll load the chronocopter later on in the evening. That's of course if it's all right with you. Yes, of course. I've checked out your electronic equipment. Good. Professor Durand, report from Station A. Your celestial charts are ready. Thank you. Hello, Durand. Oh, Durand. I'm glad to see you again. So am I. Still working as hard? How about showing me your latest creation in robots? I hear it's a masterpiece. <laughs> Around here, we have nothing but masterpieces. Omega. Come here, Omega. Omega, what's the weather report for the next 10 hours? The barometer will rise four millibars. Four millibars. Five and clear. 
Now that's fantastic. Your latest invention? Oh, nothing special. Just a small gadget. You're a lot too modest, Juro. What else does it do? He reacts to stimuli in his environment and evaluates them with his electronic brain. I recently managed to give Omega an elementary memory. Wonderful. Perhaps he might consent to play chess with me. Specially picked crew of the Cosmos Trader have reached Urania. Eight of them, scientists, mathematicians, and astrophysicists. Seven men and, and a woman. She's the physician of the expedition and has already spent two years on Luna 3. Sumiko. Break. Have I changed that much? Oh, I don't know. I've got it. Your hair used to hang down to your waist. Mr. Brinkman. Yes? You forgot this. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Robert Brinkman, the man who's always forgetting something. I have a reputation for that. You're right. But there are things I'll never forget. No, Brinkman. On a voyage of this kind, there'll be no room for excess baggage. Dr. Sumiko Omigura. 30 hours left. 30 hours and the Cosmos Raider will blast off into the unknown. Now we will leave the air. In the next few hours, the crew of eight picked for the Cosmos Raider will be unable to communicate with the world. They are going into a state of artificially induced sleep till the time comes for them to take off. This is to make sure that they will be in good physical condition for the effort to come. This is Intervision. Good afternoon. In two minutes, you'll be asleep, like all your colleagues, whether you want to or not. You'll be able to see and hear your heart. I'm very glad you're coming with us, Sumiko. That way, I'll be near you. Your heartbeat is normal. Sumiko, my heart is... No, Brinkman, no. No, please, we mustn't speak of that ever. Good night, Robert. It's time for you to sleep too, Dr. Sumiko. Yes, you're right. This is Intervision. Intervision calling the world. It won't be long now until the blast off. Tension is mounting among the scientists and technicians on the base as zero hour approaches. Everything is ready. All we're waiting for is the crew. And here they are. The of the crew are finished. They are now boarding the vehicles will take them to the Cosmos ready for blast off. Breathe calmly. Relax. Don't tense up. Ignition system ready. Ten seconds. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Stand by. Three. Two. 
One. Zero. Calling Urania, have Cosmos data on our radar screens. Appearance normal. We're feeling all right? No ill effects, huh? <sighs> Riding the clouds. <laughs> At over second cosmic velocity, we've left them way behind us. I'm gonna loosen this belt. It's uncomfortable. <laughs> hey, be careful. Don't forget there's no gravity. We're in free fall now. you well. Over and out. Hello, Luna 3. We hear you loud and clear. Minus 2, plus 5. Course normal. Course normal. Our course is exactly hyperbolic. No deviations. We are passing within 1,200 miles of you. This is Luna 3. We have established visual contact with you. That's the Sinus Roras crater. On the top of it is Luna 3. There's the solar reflector. They're signaling us. That's where her husband fell. I brought him back to the camp, but he was already dead. We were friends. You know, Sumiko is a wonderful woman. This is no three. I've picked up unexpected swarms of meteorites on our radar. Their present trajectory shows that they may cross your path and be very dangerous. We are receiving you. Over. Here are the trajectory coordinates and orbital velocity. Alpha X, 7 degrees, 2 minutes. Beta Epsilon, 48 degrees, 42 minutes. Listen, I've had an extremely urgent message from Luna 3, a meteorite warning. Professor Sikana, here's the latest meteorite report. Alpha X, 7 degrees, 2 minutes. Beta Ypsilon, 48 degrees, 42 minutes. A meteorite swarm should reach us in 48 hours at the latest. That is, if there are no orbit fluctuations. Keep close radio contact with Luna 3. Cosmos Strator calling Luna 3 have received your meteorite warning. We'll be sending you regular coordinates of our course, so stay in close contact. This is the beginning of my personal logbook. There's no one in the nerve center of the Cosmos Trader. The computer is keeping us on our course. In case of unforeseen circumstances, it can take immediate decisions to alter our speed or direction. This electronic brain will be our pilot for the next 30 days because no human being could handle the immensely complex machines of the spaceship by himself. Up to now, we have covered a distance of 
600,000 miles. Dr. Amigura is noting our reactions carefully and keeping close check on our health and well-being. The special liquid food, which can easily be absorbed in a state of no gravity, is proving very successful with all of us. Our chief engineer spends most of his time in his machine shop, testing his automats over and over again. It is thanks to them that we are relieved of many tiresome tasks. Our expert in cybernetics has to be everywhere. He's one of the key men of the expedition. Professor Sigana devotes all his time to the message from Venus. He and Chen Yu are trying to decipher the damaged spool, which means they spend long hours at the Marix. The electronic brain is working night and day, but no one can be sure what the result will be. Ah. Arringway, our commander, is keeping a constant check on our course. Your computer was active last night. It switched the rockets on for nearly 17 seconds. Perhaps to avoid the meteor swarm. We won't be running into it till tomorrow. <laughs> it looks like your automats don't have the same idea that you do. Professor Orloff is an enthusiastic chess player. He has beaten all of us, but I think he's found his master in Onaga. King G8. his endgame wonderfully. I thought that I had got him, but you see, he's put his king on e6, and I'm forced into the corner at h8. match that I've lost. I should give up, I guess. I would suggest that you make an improvement in Omega. Hmm? Oh, really? If he only had a heart, he would let Orloff win once in a while. Don't you think you could be able to do that? Hmm? Just a little bit of heart, Jerome. Trader was able to avoid meteor swarms automatically. Well, she didn't react quickly enough. She was regulated to a shower of under mass eight. That was why we had to switch on the emergency gyros. Olaf, how much course deviation? Twelve degrees, seventeen minutes. Our speed? Constant. 8.2 miles a second. I estimate the principal swarm will be on us soon. If we continue at maximum speed, it'll mean disaster. Cut the motors. We're going to decelerate. The braking motors aren't working. 
What's the matter, Doran? A meteor fragment has damaged the deceleration unit. We'd have to go outside and try and repair it right away. I'll go at once. How long before the main swarm hits us? I can't say. It may be on us any second now. Brinkman, will you help me? Professor Sikana and Chen Yu, are you all right? No bones broken. That's fine. Please give me our present deviation, direction, coordinates, and corrected course. Fasten your belts. Stand by. Principal Swarm's in sight. Is it safe to start the motors yet? Repairs completed. You're on back. Calling Luna 3. Cosmo Strader calling Luna 3. Meteor Swarm has passed. Everything okay on board. Three weeks have gone by since we left the Earth. We should reach Venus in about ten days. In spite of our enormous speed, the stars seem to hang motionless. Due to all types of disturbances caused by the planet, radio contact with Earth is no longer possible. Nothing. Too much interference. I can't hear a thing. Keep trying. Uh, Alpha X, 32 degrees, 8 minutes. Beta Y, 7 degrees. What are you doing? I'm making a heart for Omega. Ten consecutive defeats are driving our friend crazy. I want him to enjoy his favorite game. I would like you to do something also for me. It would be nice to see you eat occasionally. I swear not to forget anymore. <laughs> Sicardo said exactly the same thing. Health is my responsibility, and you haven't eaten for days. I haven't a second to spare. Sumiko. You mustn't insist. He's nervous. He's having a very hard time with that spool. You understand. E6. Check. He doesn't like that. Nate. Congratulations. You've won at last. <laughs> A neat classical end play. I think you deserve to win. He plays a good game. He's not very easy to beat. <laughs> but I did it at last. Man has defeated the machine. Yeah, too much heart. Mm. Want to try? Mm, why not? Will you all come to the Marex, please? 
Uh, it's a cosmic document. We have finally deciphered the last part of the spool. It gives complete meaning to the cosmic document. <laughs> I will translate. We will initially subject the planet to a very intense bombardment of radiation. The conquest and occupation of the Earth will then present no difficulty. When the ionization intensity has fallen by one half, the final extermination phase can start. This can only mean an attack against our planet, an invasion by the inhabitants of Venus. The cosmic document was not intended for us to read. It's a cold-blooded blueprint of destruction. We must inform the Earth. I'll try and make contact. Wait, Tom. No, let him try. Will it do the Earth any good to know what we know? The Earth is in danger. We must warn them. No. Our planet was in peril before they discovered the spool and nothing happened. That's no argument, as we haven't any idea how the Venusians calculate time. If the Earth knew of the terrible danger threatening her, unrest and even hysteria would spread like wildfire. From pole to pole, the whole world would be in a panic. No, no, Olaf. I'm convinced you're wrong. For years and years, the whole of the human race faced the danger of an atomic war. Yes. And they survived. Not through ignorance, but through knowledge. Because they knew what the danger was. Hmm? No. There won't be a panic. Chen Yu, don't you agree with me? I am sure that if we meet the inhabitants of Venus, we'll be able to convince them that it would be folly to start that war. Dalawa, try to contact the Earth. I can't get through too much disturbance with Venus. Our signals are distorted. And the Earth won't hear us. Well, what do you say? Should we turn back to Earth? No. Ah, nonsense. Return? No. Never. Durand, our speed. 31,000 miles per hour. In three days, we'll reach Venus. Good. Tell her, check our course. All off. The latest readings. Gamma radiation increasing steadily. I'll recheck the neutron count. <laughs> 5,000 miles. After only 31 days of flight, we have nearly reached our destination. All our efforts to communicate with the Earth via Luna 3 have been unsuccessful. We have started to decelerate by means of our rocket motors. Professor Herringway is guiding the ship into an elliptical orbit around Venus. We are now a satellite of this silent planet. We are still trying, but in vain, to establish radio contact with her inhabitants. A thick wall of clouds surrounds the planet. 3,500 miles. First analysis of Venus atmosphere, 27% carbon dioxide, 14% formaldehyde. No oxygen, atmosphere poisonous. Now we're faced with a difficult decision. As you know, we can only land and take off once. No point in taking any unnecessary chances. So one of us has got to go ahead as scout. 2,000 miles. We're close enough. Now I'll go in the crawler copter. OK, Brinkman. You've got to try and find a landing place for us. We'll stay in orbit at 150 miles altitude, all right? The crawler copter's ready. 1,500 miles. Well, 
Well, now, now let's don't be for. Action stations. Action stations, everyone. Seven hundred and fifty miles. Stand by. We are now entering the atmosphere of Venus. Attention. Receiver. I'm not getting you. There's something wrong with your receiver. Can you hear me now? I can't understand you. Something's wrong with your transmitter. Hello. What's the matter with our transmitter? Heavy electrical disturbance. We're completely blocked out. Hello. Brinkman. What is it, Brinkman? Herringway, can you hear me? I'm now at 1,500 feet. Visibility nil. Radar indicates that the surface is extremely mountainous. I can't see anything. I'm completely surrounded by thick clouds. Wait a minute. Yes, I can see land, boys. I can see land. Hello. Hello. Cosmos Trader, I can't hear you. I'm landing. Brinkman is not receiving us. I can't make contact. Our altitude? 24,000 feet. strange flashes of light which we keep seeing. They're bursting all around us. What do you make of them, Olaf? In my opinion, the atmosphere in this area is ionized. But what's the cause? Atomic radiation. Then that means that they're attacking us. And Brink... We must fly lower. We must get below this bank of clouds if we want to establish contact with Brinkman. Brinkman calling. Cosmos Trader, please answer me. Over. Omega. I don't hear you. Hello, hello. You hear me? This blasted radioactive forest won't let radio waves through. Go on, Omega. Go on. Keep going. 
Keep on. Hold it, Armageddon. They're attacking us. Cosmos Trader. Cosmos Trader. Do you hear me? The crawler cup has exploded. A flash. See that? What was it? I don't know. The computer shows a pressure wave. Apparently an explosion. Distance, 120 miles. Break. Oh, it could be a signal from the Venusians. We'd better land at once as best we can. Talua, make a careful check on our position. And try to contact Brinkman again. Omega, back here. Quickly. Acceleration rockets, thrust, 18, 21, 24, 27, 30. underground. You're on. Get the crawlers out of the way, or the next time the voltage mounts, exactly the same thing will happen to us. The voltage mount. Amaga. Brinkman! We thought you were dead. <laughs> I was lucky. You might have chosen a better place to land. Why? What, what do you mean? There's a high-tension line over there. <laughs> now, your machine blew up just because you landed right on top of that surface power line. All we have to do is to follow it, and it will probably lead us to the inhabitants of Venus. There's no point in trying to do that. I've already found the inhabitants of Venus, and I've brought one of them back for you. What is it? I wonder if it is a form of life. I'll investigate at once. All right, Chen Yu. And while he's doing that, let's go and try to follow that line. Okay. Amagan, come on. Crawler, please come in. Crawler, please come in. We're following the power line. Something very strange here. A white sphere that looks like a an immense golf ball. It's incredible. You think it's a machine, Olaf? Well, I can't say yet. I don't know. Everything here is so strange. It's as if we were trying to decipher a book in an unknown language. Let's hope that soon we'll be able to read it. And perhaps we'll understand. Olaf, let me know when you've got your instruments ready. 
I'll need all the figures I can get. Okay, Sakara. Good. Thank you. Tallow, stay in close contact with us. Very well, Professor. I am looking at the observation screen of the Cosmos Trader. Everything is strangely quiet. Is this the calm before the storm? Why don't the Venusians answer? Or are these metallic insects really the masters of this planet? Chen Yu is working day and night to solve the mystery of these strange creatures. investigated your strange inhabitants. They're completely harmless. They're not a form of life. When I think how scared I was in that hole. <laughs> your discovery is more significant than you think. I put one of the microcrystals in the Marex. Listen. of the Venusians. I would say that these strange metallic insects had a way of storing sound in their crystalline nuclei. Are you trying to tell us that the Venusians used these insects to record both speech and sound? That's right. But that's fantastic. Yes, but it's true. Well, that would mean that the hole which Brinkman fell into is a chamber of archives containing some of the records of this planet. But then where can the inhabitants be? They certainly saw a spaceship land. They couldn't have missed it, yet nothing happened. Nothing at all. And my machine blowing up. You call that nothing? I need more figures, more data, and especially more of those metallic insects. The research program is going according to plan. We are all fascinated by the vitrified forest. But our spacesuits are so heavy that working outside the ship is difficult. The investigation of the power lines leading to the white sphere and measurement of tension changes is done by oscillograph. The storms which whip across Venus only make the work harder. That's where the lines lead to, all right. There's no doubt. That's it. collecting samples of the sand to carry it by the storm. Sometimes they are radioactive, sometimes they are not. He is searching for traces of life. The long Venusian night is always preceded by a violent storm. Then the outside work must stop and we spend our time studying what we have found so far. This vitrified forest is a biological formation? Why not? It could come from a dried up seabed. You're wrong. It's not a natural formation. Professor Sikana has been feeding figures and data into the electronic brain and he now has some conclusions. He says that the vitrified forest is an enormous energy projector capable of destroying all life within a radius of millions of miles that it was built by the inhabitants of Venus. Yes. This vitrified forest was made to be a weapon of aggression. But then something went unexpectedly wrong. Perhaps they decided to disarm. <laughs> I'm afraid it was more serious than that. The metal insects you found for us show us something very significant. That's very interesting. Go on, tell us more, Professor Sakarna. I do not yet have all the facts, but I think that a terrible catastrophe took place on Venus. I reached a certain stage, 
I can't get any further. It's chaotic. It's like, it's like everything was broken. Now, if there really was a catastrophe which changed the face of the whole planet, then it was so huge a catastrophe as to be absolutely beyond our powers of comprehension. We can only solve this problem by means of further systematic research. Take this great white sphere to which all these power lines lead and whose function we don't understand. It appears to be a giant transformer unit, or else it is a, a force field generator. Another strange thing is that there is periodic tension in the main power line. I would even suggest that there might still be Venusians inside the sphere who have survived the colossal catastrophe that befell their planet. They could still be trying to send an SOS to another station. What should we do? We must go out and explore. We'll follow the main power line to the other end. Yes. Calling the Cosmos Trader. We have been driving for nearly seven hours now. We are following the energy line, and so far we haven't found a trace of life. This power line's got to end somewhere. Uh, Herringway, shall we keep going? Yes. on following us and watch out. What's that? I don't know. They're not natural forms. They must have been buildings of some sort. as high a temperature here as on the sun. And every living thing was destroyed by an incredible catastrophe. What are you thinking, Simiko? Of the damage. servicing it, since it's apparent that this whole installation is still under tension. Omega, 
What is it? Beat me. Strange, what could it be? It might be the missing power source. Look at those bubbles. It could be a kind of organic life. radiation bombardment. Thanks to this device, they calculated how atomic beams could be directed to our planet. I think you're quite right. And directly beneath us is their operational headquarters. Everything is clear. The sphere creates an artificial force field. 
which strengthens the gravitation of Venus and diminishes it. At this very moment, the power is augmenting. And when the energy is inverted, the field will reverse itself. We'll be hurled into space again. Don't worry, Professor. There's still time. Call Herringway quickly. Hello, Herringway. Come in, please. from the underground nerve center. Look at the key it's using to decode them. Quiet. It's incredible, Sakarna. E equal to MC squared. That's Albert Einstein's old formula. Yes, but their integration factor is a curve closed upon itself. Take a look. It's interesting. Wonderful. Those are seeds. They're plant seeds. Where did you find them? I found them on the surface near the nerve center. They were certainly carried there by one of those big storms. If these seeds are still fertile, it proves there is life on this planet. Professor Sticano wants everybody in the Marics, please. Our researches on the metal insects found in the cave have told us a little of this planet's history. As to the message we heard, there's no doubt about it. The inhabitants of Venus were contemplating launching an atomic attack on our planet. But the attack wasn't carried out. In accident, they didn't expect to upset their plan. Their atomic weapons got out of their control, a chain reaction was unleashed, and they all perished. Only their shadows remained. And their energy projectors, although partially destroyed, are capable of working again if their energy reactions are set in motion by some accident or even by one of us. Why, what do you mean? That we've started the reaction? When that rock fell into the black mud, what happened? But the rock was thrown out as if the slime was a living thing. Then something terrible happened. The slime began to grow rapidly. First, it dilated. Now tell us, what happened next? The black slime started to move. Yes, it began to follow us. We were cornered. What did you do? I used the Deuteron ray gun and I shot into it. You should never have done that. You started an atomic reaction. There was nothing else to do. We had no other way of getting out. Yes. You started a chain reaction over the whole atomic installation. Now we're really in a nice mess. What can we do? What time was it? 17 hours 10. I remember. Yes. Yes. It was at that moment that the sphere turned red. It looks as if mass changed into energy by process rather like that of the atom bomb. The people of this planet knew how to reverse the process. They changed mass into energy, but also they could change energy back into mass. Fantastic. The ends of Venus are, or rather were, far in advance of us in the applications of physics. That's one thing we have to acknowledge. Omega, stop! 
Omega! And switch off all the automats. Tower, come and help me. Oh. Oh, the glass floors. The glass floors off. The sphere is turning red. Olaf. The radiation from the glass forest has upset Omega's electronic brain. The Marax computer has gone out of action as well. Look. On increasing like this, we won't have a chance. Even the Cosmostrator's leg shielding won't be enough to protect us. Come on. I think he has internal injuries. I must operate. Start up the rockets, Dumbo. We must take off at once before it's too late. The motors won't work. The gravity field is increasing more and more. The radiation's paralyzed everything. Nothing is working. The whole Cosmostrator is nothing but an inert lump of metal. One chance. We must try to do what the Venusians did. Make the energy of the glass force in the sphere change back into mass once more. Yes, but how? When the mud attacked you on the tower. And you decided to use the ray gun which changed the mass into energy. I think I saw something was happening in the Venusian nerve center. I think I know how to start the reverse process. Can I use the rocket plane? You're forgetting the gravity field, it won't fly. But the chlorocopter will work. You mustn't go alone. I'll come with you. to fix the computer. Can you, can you hear me? Where are you? We're starting to climb down into the Venusian nerve center. Save the others. Hanningway! I can't hold out for long. My air's escaping. The sphere is white again. Look, Sicana. Talio has succeeded in reversing the field. My spacesuit is punctured. My oxygen's escaping and the safety device has failed. 
Try to hold out, Shen Yu. You've got to. The gravity is back to normal. I'll set off at once in the rocket plane. I'll get you out of it, Chen Yu. Hold on, I'm coming with oxygen. Chen Yu! Hello, Chen Yu! Hold on! Brinkman is coming! Chen Yu! Chen Yu! I must talk to him. Chen Yu, listen to me. Those seeds that you found, they're growing. They're growing, Chen Yu. You've proved that there's life on the planet. Yes, Chen Yu, there's still life on Venus. We're being pushed off the planet. The reverse process is in action. The energy field is acting like a catapult. The negative gravity is increasing. We have learned. 
bit much. But we have sacrificed a lot. Too much. Son of the memory of three great men. Talua saved the expedition from disaster. Chen Yu discovered life on Venus. And Brinkman was the first human ever to set foot on the planet. May they never be forgotten. We found traces of a great civilization that had advanced beyond our comprehension. The Venusian science had gone beyond their power to control it. A dreadful catastrophe fell upon them. They were destroyed by their own machines. We still have a grave task before us. We must use our knowledge to establish life again on Venus. And then after that, go on to explore the other planets. We'll fly further and further mankind's destiny.